The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Burke, and I'm along here with Andy Capehart, and we are with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, APS TARP, and I want to welcome you to our webinar. I will introduce our speakers here in a moment. Now, before we get started, I would like to share a little bit of information. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARP, which is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and is administered by the WRMA Incorporated. Contractors and speakers' findings, conclusion, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. This webinar is being brought to you by a collaboration among all the Administration for Community Living's Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services Resource Centers. You see them listed on the slide, and we invite you to visit the websites of each center to learn more about the work they do. Today's slides are available to download where you can access these links. Now on to some housekeeping. Handouts and the slides, as I mentioned, are available in the handout section of your webinar control panel. You may download them at any time. Please use your computer speakers to access audio for this webinar. Please make sure the speaker volume is adjusted to your desired volume. If you experience audio or connection problems during this presentation, we recommend that you sign out of the webinar and re-enter. This typically fixes most of those issues. We're planning to have time at the end of the panel discussion for questions and comments, but you may ask questions of our presenters at any time by typing them into the questions box in your webinar control panel. We will relay as many as we can to the speakers when we pause for questions at the end of the presentation. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the APS TARC website at a later date along with the copy of the slides. We will notify all registrants via email when it is posted online. Everyone attending today will receive an email approximately 24 hours with a link to download your certificate of attendance. And be sure to take the brief eval survey when prompted. We always love to hear your feedback. Now, before we get started, let's get a sense of who's joining us today through a quick attendee poll. Which of the following do you identify the most with? This is a single choice answer. Social service professional, legal assistant professional, medical professional, justice professional, or other? We'll give you a few, few seconds here to go ahead and take that poll. Give you a few more seconds. All right, let's go ahead and close that poll. So it looks like 73% social service professional, 6% legal assistance professional. We have 1% medical professional, 3% justice professional, and 17% other. Thank you for taking that poll. It's my pleasure to now introduce today's speakers. We have Erin Key, Aging Program Specialist, Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services, Administration on Aging, Administration for Community Living, U.S. Department of Health and, Service, Health and Human Services, Jackie Blasey-Fried, Assistant Director of the Consumer Branch, United States Department of Justice. Then we have Ali Chu, Lead Supervisor of Consultative Services, Elder Abuse Prevention, Aging and Disability Resource Center, and Support in Independent Living. Rachel Gibson, MS Director, Center for Victim Service Professionals, the National Center for Victims of Crime. And Lauren Bambaco, U.S. Postal Inspector, U.S. Postal Inspection Services. Now we're going to hear some open remarks from Erin Key with the Administration for Community Living. Erin, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you all for joining the 2023 Administration for Community Living and Department of Justice's Fraud and Scams webinar series. And thank you to APS TARC for hosting this webinar series. Today is the third webinar in this four-part series. 
Throughout the year, we are taking a comprehensive look at the lifespan of scams and frauds with the framework that the best response is a holistic person-centered practice from all professionals and advocates involved in addressing these types of situations. In the first webinar in the series, titled The Fraud Pitch, we discussed how mental frameworks impact an individual's susceptibility to fraud, as well as recent research on fraud pitches and insight into why they succeed. That webinar shared an example of a successful fraud prevention program in Marin County, California, that included partnerships across multiple community organizations and agencies. In the second webinar in the series, titled Reporting and Recovering Funds, we talked about how to report scams and frauds and recover funds for victims. We also discussed why reporting is critical to combating these scams and frauds, including how the information provided in reports can be used to prevent further crimes. Our, our presenters during that webinar provided guidance on how you can provide support for someone who is making a report, and we focused on what information it's important to include, as well as strategies that can be used when attempting to recover funds. We also had information based on unique payment types available. If you are interested in watching either of these earlier webinars, you can check them out on the APS TARC's YouTube channel by going to youtube.com backslash at APS TARC. Today, we will have a panel conversation with our experts about how to identify the emotional toll taken by fraud, the range of emotions experienced by victims, and how that might impact how you respond and assist these individuals as they recover. We will also discuss what tools you can have in your toolbox to help victims through their emotional recovery. We have already identified some questions for our panelists to help dig into these topics, but we want to encourage audience participation today. So please be thinking of what questions pop up for you as our panelists talk. We will open the conversation up to audience questions later in the webinar. Our goal with this webinar series is to provide actionable learnings that empower all of us to collaborate and partner so that we can better fight frauds and scams. We hope the lessons in today's webinar will help you learn some steps that you can take to empower older adults to overcome the mental and emotional effects of fraud. In our final webinar, coming up in December, we will talk about what we can all do to arm consumers with the information they need to prevent fraudsters from succeeding in their attempts to take money and information from them. Attendees will come away from that webinar with information about awareness, ideas and resources available, as well as, as, well as methodologies and approaches that build trust with elders at risk for exploitation. We hope you can join us for this final webinar in the series. This time I'm gonna turn it back over to Jessica. Jessica? Thank you so much, Erin, for those opening remarks. As Erin uh, said, today we will have a panel discussion that's gonna be led by Jack, Jackie Blasey-Free. She, again, she's the Assistant Director of the Consumer Protection Branch, United States Department of Justice, and I'll hand it over to her in a bit. And again, I just wanted to acknowledge our panelists today. So we have Ali Chu, the Lead Supervisor of Consultative Services, Elder Abuse Prevention, Aging and Disability Resource Center and Support in Independent Living. We also have Rachel Gibson, MS Director, Center for the Victim Service Professionals, the National Center for Victims of Crime. And then our third panelist is Lauren Bombaco, the U.S. Postal Inspector, U.S. Postal Inspection Service. So Jackie, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you to kick us off on our panel discussion. Perfect. Thanks so much, Jessica. I'm very excited to be with you all today. So my role in the consumer protection branch of the Department of Justice is to really prosecute the scammers and the fraudsters. But one of the difficulties that we face in almost every investigation is working with victims and helping victims not only gather what we need in order to prosecute the fraudsters, but working with them through their emotional journey, whether it be anger, whether it be fear, whether it be distrust, whether it be empowerment 
where they want to help us prosecute the individual. So I'm really excited to have three presenters with us today who are going to talk to us from three very different viewpoints, where in their work with victims, what have they seen in terms of emotional toll? And in their experiences, what are some of the tools that we all have in our collective toolboxes in order to help victims, recognizing every victim and every individual is different, but what are the, some of the tools that we have to help those individuals on their journey and recovering emotionally from what can be a devastating fraud experience. And with that, Ali, I think I want to start with you, and I'm hoping that you will set the stage for us a bit. When we talk about individuals who have experienced a scam or maybe some type of fraud by a family member, can you talk about the range of emotional responses someone might experience and then how that might impact our ability to help that individual? Absolutely. Can you guys hear me all right? You sound perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and and um, can, uh, Jessica, if you could go to that slide where we have a picture. Um, yes, give me one second here. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, and a lot of people, I'm sure you recognize this picture. This is Mickey Rooney. Um, he has since passed away a few years ago, and, and this is a very, very famous quote, and I'd like to start us today with this quote. It says in his testimony, for years I suffered silently. I didn't want to tell anybody. I couldn't muster the courage, and you have to have courage. I needed help, and I knew I needed it. Even when I tried to speak up, I was told to shut up and be quiet. So the reason I, I, I really wanted to put it out, out there is that this is someone who was very powerful, right? He had a lot of power. He was very famous, but this is his experience, right? All this fear, all this uh, thing that Jackie was talking about. You know, we, 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 we look at our uh, survivor, and I, I like to use the word survivors. Uh, we look at our survivor, we, we work with them. We see that they experience denial, fear, anger, shame. Shame is so huge, right? And isolation, that feeling of nobody knows what's going on and nobody can help me. And I see that a lot with um, LEP, the limited English proficiency, um, you know? And then also when we work with client, we see those emotion, you know, and, and, and taking that consideration of that fact when they experience um, manipulation. And, and, and gaslighting, you know, and those are huge and very, very powerful. I just kind of want to start us and, you know, of course I can come back to, you know, to talk about more. One thing I remember working with a client recently is that, you know, she was monolingual Chinese speaking. Uh, when, we, when we spoke to her, the fear was, was really, really apparent. Um, she really felt like she didn't understand the system. She didn't understand how to report, how to reach out. And uh, she only spoke up because her son had Thanksgiving with her and realized that she was a little off and he asked her and that's when she broke down and told what happened to her. So, so not being able to speak English, not being able to know the system, you know, it, it, this, this, this really, really complex. So I wanna stop there and, and, and we can talk more about um, other stuff too. Yeah, and one thing, Allie, when you were giving that description of sort of in your experience, what you have seen, you use the term gaslighting, and that's something that I was not familiar with, sort of the use of that term when you and I first had a conversation. Can you explain what you mean by gaslighting and how that might impact a victim's willingness, whether it's to engage with a social service provider or law enforcement? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, all the, in the old time, I, I used to work in the domestic violence fields, and, you know, it, there's a different word, coercion, right? We used to work coercion, and, and I think the current time people used to work gaslighting is really making the ever slash victim like it's their fault. They are the one that can't understand. They are the one that's confused. They are the one that's crazy. They are the one that should be blamed. So, so in experiencing all these other emotions, this is on top of that. I hope that answers your question. 
Yeah, no, that's very helpful. So, Rachel, let's turn to you. Uh, given the range of emotions that Allie has talked about and some, you know, from your own experience, what you have seen victims of frauds and scam experience, what are some of the tools that are in all of our toolboxes that we can turn to to help victims through this emotional recovery? And let's focus first um, sort of on the short term. What might victims need shortly after the scam attempt has occurred? And then we'll talk a little bit later about what might they need in the long term. Term. But let's focus on short-term tools first, Rachel. Sure, and I think Allie did such a great job setting that up. And when we talk about that gaslighting, when we talk about sort of those that emotional response, people appearing aggressive or mean or, or loud or angry, the first tool we have is to believe that they have experienced something traumatic. And I think when we start by believing, whether it be a violent crime or a crime of financial fraud, exploitation or abuse, believing them can change the way in which they uh, experience that sort of follow-up care, which could be uh, a criminal justice response, a civil response, reporting, or just um, just letting their friends and family know what they have experienced. So that's the first thing: is to believe what they're saying and to to honor that. I think the other piece is, especially when we talk about financial fraud and crimes that affect people who are typically um, from uh, minoritized or marginalized communities, is that they are often sort of afraid to report, afraid to say something in fear that either if I'm living with a disability, I'll be removed from my home. If I am a person who English is not my first language, um, I might be free. Uh, fearful of deportation. And so um, making sure that we are empowering them to say that while you may have experienced this one thing, that you are not, uh, you, you are the victim, you are the victim, you are not at fault for what you have experienced. Someone chose to perpetrate this crime against you and that you can still be an expert in your life. And so those are for, sort of those first two emotional responses. If we wanna break down and go into sort of the tangible things, the actual things people can do, really thinking about what accounts, what information is being shared about you. We live in a social world. Our information is being funneled through so many different streams of, of social media, of accounts, of websites. And so really understanding what information is out there about us so that if there are things that are fraudulent or scams, we can sort of recognize where those things might be coming from. Did they target me because my information is public on Instagram? Did they target me because I am a member of this affinity group and the person who is um, leading this sort of fraudulent um, activity is a, a member of this group? And so figuring out where our information is and how do we lock down that information if safe to do so. I think the other biggest piece about this is document, document, document. And documentation is gonna look different for everyone. We call it safety planning. Uh, it's part of that safety planning in, in uh, domestic violence, but safety planning and documenting means getting that who, what, when, where, and if there is technology being used. So who is perpetrating it? Do you know? Is it a friend? Is it a family member? Is it someone you met um, on, a, on a dating site? What information do they have? Where is that information? Um, if money has been removed from my account, what date did those happen? Did my bank flag anything? Making sure that people can sit down and really sort of go from start to finish of when they started experiencing these sorts of crimes is gonna be very important. I think the other thing to consider is to uh, contact your financial institution platforms or other sort of agencies. A lot of companies, a lot of uh, government organizations and people are working together in what we call these multidisciplinary teams or bringing experts together to sort of track trends. And so if, if people feel it's safe to report, and again, reporting can be to law enforcement, it could be to the FTC, it could be to the Better Business Bureau, it could be to if the scam happened or fraud happened on, uh, on their banking website, if, if they experienced a romance scam where they shared money via uh, a dating app, 
reporting to that dating app. So making sure people know that they can report and that they have options. I think that's the other tool that we have is making sure that victims and survivors have informed decision-making capabilities. So they know all of their reporting options. They know where they can go to get help. They know that there are resources out there. And so we're culling all that sort of information even before the first victim comes to us. We're building partnerships with our local banks. We're building um, relationships with law enforcement. We're making sure that if something happens, we know where we can direct uh, victims and survivors too. And so I think those are some of those initial uh, conversations. And then I think lastly, I'll leave with just sort of that trust and transparency. And so how do we build trust? Well, we are honest about what our obligations are. So if I'm working with an older adult or a person living with a disability and I'm a mandated reporter, I let them know what those obligations are. If I'm working with someone and, and they report to the FTC or another government organization, I let them know that they may not hear anything for a while or at all and that their report is still important that someone is working behind the scenes but they may not hear anything i let them know that this could be a very long process and they may not get their money back there are you know options for recourse but they they may be difficult and that might take a while and so we're building trust we're talking about transparency we're looking at all of the options all of the information we can give uh, victims and survivors to sort of make those decisions. So I think um, some of those things are short term, again, changing those accounts, locking those accounts down, slowing down, making sure if it's too good to be true, uh, then to, to, to not go into it. And then some of those long term sort of things we're doing, which is relationship building, which is keeping our, 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 um, our, um, we're, we're, we're looking around, we're being not necessarily suspicious, but we're being mindful of what we're hearing. And we're telling our friends and family if something seems off, we're, we're documenting, we're sharing information with our, our uh, law enforcement and other colleagues in the field to let them know that this is what we're hearing. Yeah, that's phenomenal, Rachel. And I've certainly seen that, you know, when you give victims an action plan, you give them something they can do to reclaim some of that agency, some of the independence, even if it is just going to identitytheft.gov and developing, you know, a toolkit as to the things that they need to do, having that agency is definitely something that's meaningful to people. So thank you so much for that. And, you know, since you brought up reporting, um, you know, Lauren Vambaco is a postal inspector who I work very, very closely with and there's frankly not a day that goes by or a week that goes by where Lauren and I are not talking about you know consumer complaints that we're seeing or SARS that we're seeing so Lauren I want to sidetrack a little bit to you and if you could tell every fraud victim in the country one thing about reporting to law enforcement what is that message that you would want to relay to victims all across the country about what we are able to do because of those victim reports um so I would encourage anybody and everybody to report in whatever method, um, like was already said, because we actually do, in fact, although I know Rachel alluded to, sometimes people don't hear things, at least in a timely manner. Um, unfortunately, government agencies are not necessarily the most timely on a regular basis, but reporting the information is hugely important. Um, I particularly work scams that target seniors, and oftentimes you don't just have one fraudster that's targeting one individual. The fraudsters catch are cast such a huge wide net that they could be communicating with 5, 10, 15, 20, 100 different people. And the only way that we're able to actually tie people together is through detailed information that is in fact reported. So I can say that I have sat through some, I'm gonna call them painstaking meetings where we're reviewing thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of documents in like 10 point font. So not painstaking because it's not worth it, but just looking at the minute details and comparing. So. Um, luckily, we do have access to certain systems as well where we can keyword search specific data. So if we're if we know, you know, our fraudster is using a specific name when he calls individuals and tries to convince them that they won the lottery, we can do keyword searching in specific um, programs. I'm sorry, 
in databases where we search for that name, like, you know, John Smith or whatever the case may be. And we can also do some other keyword searching regarding addresses and phone numbers and um, email addresses. So I think it's incredibly important for anybody to do any form of reporting, whether it's to ic3.gov or local police departments, whatever the case may be. Um, I know sometimes there is some issues between you know, local, federal, state, we don't know where to go. If you can report it to more than one, that would be great. Um, that way you're covering your bases. And I also think that bleeds into some empowerment when it comes to empowering you know, the victims because they are actually speaking their truth and they are providing information and you know unfortunately like we had already alluded to they won't necessarily get a phone call back immediately however in the past we have contacted people that have filed you know reports years prior and sadly the scammer is still you know active and involved so i can't stress enough how important it is to report in some way shape or form because it does not fall on deaf ears i promise you it does not yeah and it's interesting i you know when i often talk with people about reporting you know i'll get questions like well why should i report the fake name that a fraudster is using when they're trying to contact a victim because it's a fake name but we have built cases on that fake name because that same fraudster will use the same fake name with every single victim and those victim complaints might otherwise look totally unrelated but because they're using the same fake name you know, we're able to build not a $10,000 case, but a $10 million case based off of something that, you know, the victim might not have thought was critical, but was the key piece of information for us. So that's very helpful, Lauren. And I think let's stick with you. One thing I really want to give um, an opportunity for you, all three of you to talk about, but Lauren, let's start with you. I think the elephant in the room when we're talking about fraud victims, especially when we're talking about those victims who are chronic victims, someone who has maybe been on a fraudster's hook for a significant period of time or maybe unfortunately has been on multiple fraudsters hooks for a substantial period of time the elephant in the room is always how do we convince someone who's reluctant to admit that they're a victim that they are in fact a victim and of course there's no silver bullet here um, but lauren let's start with you what are some of the strategies that you employ in your work or you know other people employ to try to convince individuals who are reluctant to believe that they're a victim, that they are in fact a fraud victim? So it, it's definitely one of our bigger challenges, um, especially with law enforcement. So I do come from a social service background. Um, my job prior to becoming a postal inspector, I was worked at for six years. So I did deal with um, victims in some way, shape or form in that job. And I really do appreciate the work that that is, it's a very, it's challenging um, to say the least. So I do appreciate that. But I really think that that actually helped me become better with how to speak to people in general, especially during interviews and whatnot. So I think one key thing is time and patience. Um, sometimes victims are not ready to speak their truth when we want them to. And I think a lot of times, particularly with law enforcement, we get frustrated because we want what we want when we want it. Maybe that's just people in general. But I think, you know, it's just a matter of allowing the victim the time that they need to process. They may not be processing at the same rate that we want them to. And that's OK. Um, it's important. And Rachel touched on this before to acknowledge their feelings. We need to recognize that, you know, our opinion may be that, you know, the person that fell in love online, it was unrealistic or whatever the case may be, but they, that person truly did fall in love with someone that they never met. And who are we to judge because we weren't sitting in their shoes. So I think it's empowering when you speak to a victim and actually acknowledge, you hear what they say and acknowledge it. So I think that's what part of it. You have to hear it and then also acknowledge it. Um, another thing is choosing your words wisely. 
we have to be incredibly careful. And I think, um, sadly, law enforcement is really bad at this, at how we speak about or to victims. We need to be incredibly cautious about using victim blaming language. That's sort of what Ali was, you know, talking about with the gaslighting. You know, there are, how could you? We, we oftentimes in trying to get the, to the nitty gritty details, don't realize that the way that we speak to people is also re-victimizing them. And we have to be incredibly careful with how we speak to people. Um, I'm also a proponent of planting a seed. Um, and in some cases with a more chronic victim, many, many seeds are needed. And I think, again, that can be frustrating at some at times, but when you are using facts and speaking the truth, people can't necessarily deny it. They may not want to believe it. However, if you bring up a specific situation or if someone will just use a romance scam, if someone truly believes that the person that they, you know, are talking to online is, you know, again, I'll use Mr. Smith from Dallas, Texas. Well, Mr. Smith from Dallas, Texas is in fact in a, a doctor and you can show that his name is not in fact Mr. Smith and he's using the same pictures. Those sorts of things, while may initially the victim could say like, well, you know, and that's not true or whatever, that's something that they may think about in the future. And I think it's also important to note that you can change your tactic or your strategy when you're speaking to a victim. So again, I work in the scam angle and um, I had a lottery scam victim, unfortunately that was you know being victimized over the phone and believed that she won a lottery. So when I called her because she sent um, a package to Connecticut, I was asking her, you know, general questions. Who did you send this to? And all of her answers and responses were very vague. She wouldn't really share. So I asked specifically, who did you send this to? And her response was my friend. And I said, what's your friend's name? And then the response was, I don't know. So at that point, I, I, I knew that she was being dishonest. And unfortunately, a lot of times the fraudsters tell victims to keep their winnings a secret and don't tell anybody, et cetera, et cetera. So I, so I knew that going in. So I sort of changed from a more hand help, hand holding um, kind interview and I became a little more direct and a little more firm, I will say. I was never mean, I was never nasty, I was never yelling or anything like that. Um, and I, I sort of called her out on her dishonesty because I knew what was happening. And, you know, she took a pause and then she started telling me the whole story. And at the very end of the conversation, she apologized to me for lying and I told her I understood why she did it. And I understood that she was told, you know, X, Y, and Z. And she actually thanked me in the end for bringing it out of her. I think she was actually more upset about being dishonest with me than she was about sending money for the fraud. And another example is when we had a trial, um, it was on multi multiple defendants, it was related to a romance scam. Um, this was also in Connecticut, which is where I formerly worked before coming down to DC and working with Jackie. And we had a romance scam victim and, you know, the trial, we made an error. Our, we split the list of people that we were making contact with. And um, my co-case agent was a male, and this is nothing wrong with men, but he was the one that contacted this initial victim um, twice. And it did not go well either time. Um, she said she didn't want to talk about it. She denied being a victim, et cetera, et cetera. So she actually was crucial in our case because she actually sent a handwritten note to our fraudsters. So that being said, she was really important for evidence purposes and for, you know, moving. We wanted her story out there. 
So instead of having a man call her, we two females ended up calling her. Um, and she was reluctant to cooperate in the beginning, but through supportive family, she did agree. Um, she actually came and testified. The trial prep went great. She came and testified at the trial. She did an absolute incredible job testifying. Um, and, you know, at the end, she said that she wanted to look the fraudster in the face. The person that she knew was pretending to be somebody else online. And she was incredibly thankful to us for, you know, in, gently encouraging her. Um, and it really was incredible to see the empowerment that she felt after that. So um, I think, you know, not every single person is going to be able to be approached in the exact same way. Um, so it's okay if you need to change, you know, your method or your tactic and, you know, just be honest and be truthful, like Rachel had said. Yeah, that's really great, Lauren. And I heard from, you know, your discussion, time, patience, maybe changing your technique, acknowledging what the person is experiencing and sort of being ready when they are ready to share their experiences. So Allie and Rachel, I'd also like to hear from you. This is frankly the question I get every presentation I do, which is how do you convince a victim that they're a victim? So from your experience, you know, based on what Lauren has already said, Allie or Rachel, do you have anything to add to this conversation as to what tools are in our toolbox to help victims recognize uh, what's happening to them as part of their experience. Rachel, let's start with you. Thank you. I think the only thing that I would add, because Lauren was very comprehensive, would be that I would consider, again, bringing in your partners. Um, when I have worked with victims, if, if they have come to me and I have given them the information and they're still not sure, then I have my, my law enforcement colleague talk to them or a colleague I know that works for the uh, American Bankers Association or FINRA or uh, places like that. And so again, this is where partnership development is gonna be important because if I'm saying it, law enforcement saying it, FINRA, bankers, everyone else is saying this, the same message. This can be a really good tool to sort of help someone who is experiencing this um, on multiple occasions to sort of identify that this is a, um, it, it is a scam and it is a fraud. I think the other thing is to uh, bring in that emotional piece as well. For many folks who are experiencing chronic fraud victimization, they are isolated, they're lonely, and they don't have folks that they can talk to. And oftentimes if someone calls them on the phone or reaches out, that might be the one time they actually talk to someone. And so helping them uh, decrease that isolation, helping them find a community. Uh, I think the other piece here is peer-to-peer -peer support. So if there are other folks who have experienced this fraud, uh, these sorts of things, and, um, and they feel comfortable sharing their story, have them talk with the person and say, hey, this is what I saw and this is what I know to be true. I think the last thing I would say is Google it. Um, use your search engine. So have them put it in there and do a reverse image search or look it up and see what that information says. And I know we can't believe everything on the internet, but I do think it is a good sort of first step for someone who is experiencing this over and over to have them do the research into this company and, and have them prove you wrong. If it is true, then have them prove that. And, and, and do that research. But I think that would be the only sort of supporting things I would add. That's very helpful, Rachel. Allie, let's turn to you. Is there anything that you would like to add on this topic? Absolutely. And, and I really want to say, I, I really echo a lot of stuff. Um, these two wonderful women have been saying, you know, breaking that isolation, you know, taking people out of that, that box of isolation. You know, there are other people who are experiencing that, probably support group, you know, things like that. The other aspect I really want to bring in is there's so little information out there in different languages. You know, people who might be immigrant, who might have fear uh, to the government or authority may not want to reach out. So those barriers, we have to break that barrier. We have to say, you know, if we are going to refer you to a support group, those support groups have to be in that language. We can't use interpreter. It's just not going to work when you run and any, anyone who has run support group before, we know that it just doesn't work. So bringing that cultural and language piece in, it is really, really important. 
Yeah, that's that's a great comment, Allie. Thank you so much for that. So um, let's talk resources, ladies. Um, what resources do you recommend our audience consider for their clients? Or if that's not your cup of tea for the day, what resources can the people who are on the line and listening to today's webinar maybe utilize to help better equip themselves to be able to address this issue? Uh, Rachel, let's kick it off with you. Let's talk resources. Sure. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the one we have here at the National Center, which is our Taking Action Guide, a, a, a guide for victim advocates and anyone uh, who is supporting a victim uh, of uh, financial fraud. And they can get that at, at our website, victimsofcrime.org. That is a downloadable PDF resource that, that talks about a lot of what you all have covered today, as well as in some of your other webinars, which is sort of understanding what fraud is, what what does those scams look like? What's trauma and how does that affect victims of financial fraud? And then some other resources. So that first one is our taking action, assisting victims of financial fraud. The other piece I, I would say is that there are, are several different reporting options. So one of which that we have worked with the FTC on is a, um, a coded link that is forwarded in the National Center for folks to report to the FTC. And I can put all of this in the chat where they can make those reports. Um, so that's another really good resource. Also, um, the FINRA Investor Education Foundation, who is a partner of ours, they have a lot of really good resources that talk about um, broker check, which is if someone is uh, claiming to be a, a broker uh, where you can go and check their qualifications. They have um, information for folks in the military who might be experiencing fraud, um, other sorts of worksheets. Um, so those that's a, another really good resource. And then the Cybercrime Support Network is another really good one because they offer that peer-to-peer -peer support group for victims of romance scams. And they have a lot of really good resources. So that's sort of the thing that I those um, resources I would start with always the Better Business Bureau. I also tell people to go to their local community, their local programs, victim service providers. An advocate is gonna be your probably number one best resource in a local community because they're gonna know their community and they're gonna know uh, who to reach out to. And if they don't know, they're gonna be able to find it out. So always include your victim advocates, whether they be at the law enforcement organization, whether they be at um, a, a um, an older adult organization, like an ombuds person, um, whether they be at a culturally specific program, those victim advocates are going to be your first line of resources uh, to help victims and survivors. That's quite a list, Rachel. Thank you so much. Uh, Allie, how about you? What are some resources either for victims or for service providers that you would like to proffer for the audience? How could you ask me to follow Rachel? <laughs> it's so it's a good list already. But I do want to add a couple of things. Number one is again looking at the peer to peer, like Rachel just mentioned earlier. Uh, peer to peer, you know, if they are accommodation requests, if they are needs about cultural and language. And when I say language, we have to also make sure we support, you know, the deaf community. You know, do we need to bring an interpreter? Do we need to provide that support? So those are resources I, I would really just want to add to Rachel's big list already. Yeah, I know one thing that we talk about a lot in law enforcement is how responsive fraudsters are. And you really have to find a way for the victims to almost replace that constant communication that they might have had with a fraudster with something else. And often that's going to be a peer-to-peer -peer kind of network. So that's very helpful, Allie. Lauren, how about you? Anything to add? Yeah, so again, I think two other somewhat peer-to-peer -peer resources. Um, I'm a huge proponent of also having people engage with their local senior center. Um, I've done presentations with them, or for them, I should say. And I think it's, in my experience, personal life as well as through work, it's been a great experience for people to spend time at the senior center you know doing playing games talking to people sitting having coffee whatever the case may be um also i do not work for aarp however i do work with aarp's fraud watch network the nonprofit side of aarp uh quite a bit when it comes to doing presentations um and whatnot and i know that they have a very large group of individuals across the United States that go out and um, they're all volunteer based. So that's the epitome of peer to peer. And I know that they also have a hotline. 
So I encourage anybody that has not um, poked around and looked at their website, it's incredibly helpful. And I don't know um, if there's anybody law enforcement related online, but IAFCI, which is the uh, International Association of Financial Crimes Investigators, is another really great resource. They do have a public facing webpage, as well as if you're a member, um, there's a bunch more stuff on there. And um, it's a huge resource, not only for networking, but also for, um, they have different guides. Like they have, I think they're on version three of like the fraud guide. So it's, it's basically like a law enforcement guide for how to investigate certain things. So um, I encourage anybody on the line to look into IAFCI. The website's IAFCI.org. Again, I'm not paid by them, um, but it's just something that I have felt incredibly useful through my personal experience um, as well as through work. Yeah, and so I'm going to throw in one more moderator's prerogative. Um, if you are someone who is trying to stay on top of sort of like the latest, what are fraudsters doing? How are they getting money? What pitches are they using? Uh, both the Federal Trade Commission and the Internet Crime Complaint Center, or IC3, um, have ways that you can subscribe to either blog posts or to their regular newsletters. And that will help you keep on top of, you know, what's the next scam that's coming? What's the spike that we're seeing in terms of what victims are telling us about the next threat that might be facing consumers. So if you want to sort of keep abreast, it's a great thing to read, you know, once a week with your morning coffee, just to keep abreast of um, what's happening in a fraud landscape. So um, we have just about 15 minutes left. So I'm going to ask anyone who has any questions for any of our panelists to go ahead and throw those questions in the chat. Uh, while we're waiting to see if any questions are going to come into the chat, um, one of the questions that I always like to ask whenever I have three experienced professionals on the line is, what do they wish they knew when they first started their career? So, Allie, let's start with you. Um, given your experience, what's one thing you know now about help, helping victims recover emotionally from frauds and scabs that you wished you had known at the beginning of your career? This is Ali. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. I wish I knew uh, that they are support group online before. And I know that I know that, you know, AARP and other places, they have support group. I wish I knew that. And I wish that I knew that when I was doing the, uh, you know, the, the this emotional support line, I could get that to people. So those are very helpful. Rachel, what about you? What do you know now you wish you had known when you started this journey? Wow, yeah, I think that's such a, a powerful question. And I think for me, it would be that it's okay to not know everything. I think when I was a, a baby advocate, I thought I had to have the answer to everything. And one of the one of my my uh, mentors in the work said, sometimes it's okay to tell someone you're working with, I don't know, but then you follow up and say, but I'm gonna find out. And that has really sort of guided my career, especially when we talk about fraud um, and technology and ways in which life is ever changing that I, I may not know the answer, but we're going to figure it out together because I think figuring out together with victims and survivors really sort of, again, helps empower them. It also increases my own expertise in learning, and then I know for the next one. But I think that's something that I would, um, I would say. Lauren, your turn. To sort of mimic what Rachel said, because um, I wholeheartedly agree, I would say certainly not like I didn't know about how important following up is, but I think it's hugely important when you, just looking back, when you tell someone you're gonna do something, you really need to do it because that's how you're gonna build credibility. And if you don't do it, they're not necessarily gonna listen to anything you say ever again. I mean, that's a little dramatic, but you know what I mean? It's, I think it's incredibly important to make sure you do actually follow up um, and I would also say that while I know being upfront and being honest is incredibly important, um, I think maybe this comes with maturity, I don't know, but being able to actually have those hard conversations and being able to actually tell a victim like, I'm sorry that you lost $2 million, you may never see a penny of that back. That's an incredibly difficult conversation to have but it's necessary. You can't give victims false hope either. 
So I think that's really important. Yeah, that's really helpful, Lauren. Um, all right, do we have any questions in the chat or Jessica, Andy, and Aaron, any thoughts from you as we get ready to close out today's conversation? Couple questions, this is Jessica. One is how can the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, support uh, staff in uh, scams and recovery? So I love the CFPB. Um, so the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which regulates some of the financial services portions of the industry, they have a lot of really fantastic resources. They have an Office of Older Americans that has some really great resources on helping people manage their money. They have some scam awareness sorts of materials. They also have their own complaint line. And one thing that's unique about the CFPB's complaint line is um, they actually require businesses to respond. When it's one of their regulated businesses, they send a letter to the business that says, hey, the consumer said this, do you have a response? Um, and so it's a really great resource. So the CFPB, it's a newer agency. It's not been around, you know, 100 years like the department, but they do have some phenomenal resources out there. They are also one of the federal agencies where you can actually order publications. So I am envious of them and the FTC. You can go um, on those websites and you can actually bulk order, you know, 100 play snacks on grandparent scams or, you know, 100 brochures on government imposter scams. So that's another really great tool if, if you're not familiar with it, where you can have the federal government Assuming we're all working on October 1st, um, you can have the federal government, you know, mail you those materials that you can then use in your offices and outreach. Um, anything to add from the presenters? All right, Jessica, what's next? Uh, this is a really good one. If you were developing a presentation for senior centers and like other places specifically about romance scams, what is one thing that would be a priority to convey to the audience? I can go. This is Rachel. Um, having done just that, um, I think one of the things I talk about is sort of helping older adults understand sort of the ways that people are manipulated online. And I think um, I was telling a colleague, I want to do a presentation called From Ageism to uh, Adultism um, and Everything in Between, because I, I have found that there are a lot of ways that older adults and young and youth and young adults are experiencing sort of financial fraud and crimes in a similar way. They might go about the crime, might look a little different, but some of those emotional responses are there. And one of the things that we talk about is that when someone is, is in an emotional relationship, especially with romance scams, it's going to be very hard to sort of help them identify that the person that they have built a relationship is not who they say they are on the other end. And, and especially, again, in the time of COVID and isolation and people moving away and communities dwindling, online relationships now are very important for not just older adults, but for, for most of us. And so one of the things that I talk about in that training is helping them identify when things just don't sound right, right? So like if someone were to, I just got actually got an Instagram message from someone and he called me the most beautiful woman in the world. And while I do have an uh, inflated sense of self, I started asking some questions and he said he was a doctor, but he was overseas, but he couldn't come home. And then he asked me uh, to share photos and he asked me what I did and where I lived. And he was asking a lot of invasive questions. And because I do this work, I was like, mm, this just seems a little odd. So how do we help them ask those sort of questions? I look at it as not just sort of like, I'm getting to know you, but I'm, I'm really am getting to know you questions. And I want to know if you are who you say you are at the other end. And that's getting much more difficult to prove now in this age of technology. And when we think about AI and, 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 and uh, deep fakes and manipulation, but, but there are some still some good strategies that people can take. So that's what I would start with is to say, how do we start asking those questions and how do you sort of talk about what an emotional relationship looks like when you've done when you've developed it online. Thank you so much for that. All right, another question. Many fraudsters operate internationally and are difficult to locate track. 
Are there improved methods or technologies available to assist in bringing these individuals to justice? So this is what so Lauren I can... and I do for a living. Lauren, you want to start? <laughs> so the answer is yes. I mean, obviously I can't divulge any, you know, super secret, not that I personally have any super secret means or methods, but I will say that, um, especially through the inspection service and obviously other federal agencies like the FBI who has outreach in hand pretty much everywhere, um, with the inspection service, we actually do have um, an attache that's out of the country that has been working on legislation with the country that he's in related to exactly this and um, really helping that country see the standpoint of the United States. Unfortunately, a lot of the views are very victim blaming from other countries where they they truly are like, well, you guys need to do a better job at educating and taking care of your seniors. That's their view. And while there may be, you know, a little truth to that, which, you know, sometimes the truth hurts, I also say that these fraudsters are professionals. This is what they do 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 or 66, if it's a leap year, days, a year. And this is what they do all the time. So I think it's really important for us to, you know, highlight the cases where we do have extradition from other countries. Um, and the Department of Justice website has a bunch of um, press releases and whatnot that people can search and see that I would say probably 10, 15 years ago, we probably were not having the rate of extraditions that we are. Um, and Jackie, please jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, add. Yeah, no, I think that's right. The, uh, the only other thing I would add to, to Lauren's conversation is, you know, when we think about a scam, we typically think about two people. We think about the victim and we think about the person who is on the phone or behind the computer. But in reality, it takes an entire ecosystem of actors to commit a fraud scheme. There are people who are involved in, you know, lead list providing for victims, who are involved in the communications aspect of it, who are involved in the money mule piece of it, money moving piece of it. And even when, you know, the fraudster is overseas and maybe it's going to take us some time to identify and get the fraudster, we are getting increasingly more effective at the other touch points. And often those touch points are in the US. So we can work these large international scams from multiple directions. We can pursue the foreign fraudster while we take out the infrastructure that they are using to commit the fraud. And I think we have about four minutes left. So one more question. Uh, sorry, we couldn't get to all of them. But any tips for helping older adults cut off contact with scammers without losing all of their other contacts? Example, changing their phone number, email, deleting Facebook, et cetera. So this is Rachel. I could start with some of that. I think, and especially when we think about who's committing the crime. Um, so if it's a person that they know, um, or if it's a caregiver, family member, I think those safety planning strategies are going to look a little different because there's a relational um, piece there that could put them in danger should they just cut off them cold turkey. But but I think you, this person brings up a really good point, um, which is starting over is super hard. And our life is connected to so many different devices and places and things. And so that may not be a safe or viable option for everyone. But it is to say, if there is an email account that they know is associated with one sort of fraud or scam that they need to keep open, maybe they only keep it open for certain things and start migrating their other information over to a safer uh, email. Or um, if, again, they are using social media and they maybe need to do a purge, maybe you don't know who all 950,000 people are as your Facebook friends. And so maybe we talk with them about cleaning that up and, and making sure that the people who they know um, in their life know that they, are, ha they have experienced this. And so asking them not to share photos of them, asking them not to post information about them, um, keeping their information 
uh, sort of locked down. And so there are strategies and I can share some uh, other really good resources, um, but there are some strategies that people can do to help mitigate their risk that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to start over, but it means that they may have to reevaluate how they operate in those places. So if I'm gonna use social media, if I'm gonna use my email account and figuring out what those options are. And I think the other piece is, again, remembering who has access to that, right? So not only just sort of thinking about that, but thinking about what that access is and if I need to sort of enact two-factor authentication or if I need to change my password or whatever that might be. But I'll defer to my other colleagues if they have any other um, advice. So I can just jump in real quick and also just add that when I have done presentations to um, seniors in a variety of ways, I always tell people it's okay to say no and it's okay to not answer the phone. And it's okay that if you do answer the phone and the person starts a pitch, you can hang up on them. Unfortunately, people need to be reminded of this because a lot of times um, individuals are afraid because they're being rude well the person's trying to steal money or i mean mostly right but the person's trying to steal your money so it's okay to be rude that's i always remind people it's okay don't answer the door it's okay if it's somebody important they'll reach back out all right thank you all so much for that it looks like we're uh, at time, so I would like to thank uh, Ali, Rachel, and Lauren for being part of our panel today. We got a lot of chats uh, thanking you for the resources and the networking opportunities uh, in working with people who may have fallen victim to scams. And we want to thank everybody for joining us today and investing in your professional development. And just a friendly reminder to please uh, complete your webinar evaluation when you close out the webinar. All right, everybody, thank you again and have a great day.